Hello and welcome to Bud Explains, where I take a subject, be that rules, history or concept from the role-playing world, and try to explain it to you in a way that I hope helps you understand how it works. Today's explanation is the machinations of the Migo in Delta Green, part 1. Also, I'd like to thank David Lee Ingersoll and Dennis Detweller for allowing me to use their fabulous art. I've put some links to their portfolios below. Please note that this is generally considered handler-only information, so watch at your own risk. The Migo are cited as the major unnatural threat in Delta Green, and as such, many seem to wonder why and how they are embroiled in the affairs of humanity. Their behaviour has been observed as both rational and strange, and as an alien species, they seem to be beyond our ability to understand. What is understood is that they arrived on Earth around 160 million years ago, and appear to be largely unchanged. We don't understand their interest on in our planet, though we know that they have mined it extensively. They waged war with the Elder Things, a conflict that only ended when continental drift separated their areas of interest, and at this time they were also active on the planet Yugoth, Pluto to humanity, and it remains a place where they can be found in great numbers. It is thought that they have been working for, or at least in service of, Shubnagurath, as well as being worshippers of Itlashua and Nihilathotep. In return for their worship, the crawling chaos gifts them with knowledge and power, as well as sanction to engage in activity on Earth. Itlashua is a temperamental god of the winds and remains consciously engaged on Earth and thus they pay homage. On a biological level, they are fungoid entities that can transform themselves in what appears to be a simple manner. Things such as extending their limbs and sensory receivers, and as such they are masters of cellular manipulation. They can survive easily in deep space for long periods. They can lose up to 55% of their mass and enter a state of limited perceptions, and at around 12% mass they can appear dead and inert when in danger. Additionally, they perceive reality and time in a way different than humans. 40% of their mass is devoted to intellect, and even then some of it exists in different dimensions. Despite their resilience, they are vulnerable to pain and trauma, and can be killed. As you might expect, they are supremely intelligent creatures, even if their thought process is completely different, one would say alien, to our own. Humans have a logical cause and effect mindset, but occasionally they will use intuition and have leaps of faith that will pay off. This is something that is entirely alien to the Migo, who will follow many logical paths simultaneously to find the correct answer. They have a complete lack of understanding of human intuition, seeing everything as A to B to C, and understanding that without discovering C, they cannot know D. Humans seem to be able to make the jump from A to D without the information required to reach that point, and this is something they admire and envy in humans, and understanding it is something that remains their principal interest in studying humanity. Despite this capacity for intellect, they are not infinite and they will clean out knowledge from their minds that they deem unimportant. This can be done universally with all Miko, and as such they have no clue as to their true origin, as it is not useful for them to know and understand anymore. If that information was known, it's long been discarded. Their capacity for storing information seems to be in a constant conflict with the amount of threads of logical thought they can create, and as such they are constantly discarding information, something that gives them a supreme intellect and makes them occasionally naive at the same time. The human thought process is a genuine mystery to them, and as a way of attempting to become more synchronised with this way of thinking, they've started giving more resource to lines of logical thought than storing memories, hoping to essentially emulate human intuition. At this point they have been entirely unsuccessful. They're obsessed with energy and methods of controlling it using force of will, something that the great old ones can do with apparent ease, and it appears to be their drive. They can manipulate energy, especially the hypergeometric kind, though it does require a great deal of effort, often involving complicated machinery and processes. They simultaneously praise the Great Old Ones for using the energy of stars and damn them for using that energy to reap destruction. Another fascination they have is systems that appear to have limitless potential, and humanity is considered that. They would see the destruction of humanity by the Great Old Ones as an absolute waste, and they actually work to preserve it. It is posed that if the Great Old Ones are Chaos Incarnate, then the Migo are Order Incarnate. They have a strong belief that if energy control is their ultimate power level, then eventually being able to do it as easily as the Great Old Ones would make them akin to gods themselves, considering it more of an evolutionary step rather than some kind of transcendence. They genuinely believe that this control of energy would make them masters of reality itself. 
Their current aim is to understand humanity and develop their intuition, believing that, though their own way of thinking is logical, it is also wasteful. Believing that developing intuition will allow them to make great leaps forward by refining their mental process to prevent them from wasteful thought, making them far more efficient and resourceful. They need to keep humanity alive in order to study it, and having realised that the Great Old Ones are close to returning, i.e. the stars are nearly right, they've accelerated their study, even if it risks exposing them or destroying the human system. Originally, when humans became part of the map, they were considered a minor threat, and it was an age before the Migo accepted that they had potential for development. At this point, the Migo took an interest in them, surmising that they were indeed an open system, even if they were doomed by the return of the Great Old Ones in the future. For the longest time, their encounters with humans were sporadic and badly organised, and as time passed, they came to understand that humans needed to be contacted in a way that would disturb them the least. Those occultists that worshipped the Great Old Ones were chosen due to the idea that, in dealing with such things, humans had already been acclimatised to dealing with alien races and ideas. Unfortunately, the Migo had not much to offer, and their contact was minimal. At the turn of the 20th century, they came to understand that humanity's days were numbered. As such, they increased their contact with humans during their 1920s. However, World War II caused them to take a step back and view the outcome, and the use of nuclear weapons proved to the Migo that humans had potential, given how far they'd reached in such a short time. They decided to make contact with humanity, with the intention of wringing as much information from them and about them as they could, and the ultimate aim being to make a deal with a leading human power to further accelerate their studies. First, however, they needed to put a human face on their actions that would shroud the Migos' presence. They decided to go with a visage that was based on what humans already believed that alien species looked like, the Grey. The USA was chosen due to their rapid development of nuclear weapons, and when the plan was set, they made their move in Roswell, New Mexico. The source of that Majestic 12 recovered was an entirely staged event. The bodies that were discovered were small and grey with huge eyes, a small mouth and no nose, as well as being hairless and having no genitalia. Of the four that were recovered, one was alive, the others partially devoured by wildlife. The area was cordoned off and the disc, wreckage, corpses and sole survivor were taken away by the Central Intelligence Group. Majestic 12 Special Studies Group 1, or SSG-1 for short, were responsible for studying the three alien corpses and the sole living life form. After three days of intensive study, the extraterrestrial biological entities, or EEBs, were deemed to maybe not even be extraterrestrial at all. They had things like fingernails, fingerprints, and other features of human anatomy, though there were things they did not share. When the head cavities were opened, a smelly green liquid gushed out, showing several small pump organs, and not much more, with a small smooth organ thought to be the brain being removed. The living EEB was observed to be photosynthetic, as it became sluggish and hibernated if not exposed to sunlight for eight hours. Plant light in its quarters proved this. It was theorised that this green liquid was their blood, pumped through the system and back to the epidermis, making them smell akin to burning cardboard. While Eve was at the base, strange disappearances started occurring. Soldiers and even an entire lab of animals vanished overnight. Several theories emerged from the study. Vannevar Bush decided that they were extraterrestrial, but had evolved so far beyond humanity that only small similarities could be made. Another theory was that they were humans from a distant future who had travelled in a time machine to observe their past, bringing up the fact that the ship had little in the way of supplies to allow it to traverse the stars. The third, less well-received theory was actually correct. It was posited that they were too close to humans to be real, and that they had been created by a true alien race to allow first contact to go smoothly, with the alien craft and crew having produced the exact kind of response that would have been expected. Even to this day, Majestic 12 is unaware of this fact. Over time, the Eeb came to be known under the classification Hominid Xenoanthropus, shortened to HX. The interactions with the survivor became minimal, with the odd occasion that it answered the question causing the researcher to become more confused. It seemed to have an inability to understand the concept of plurals, and would refer to itself as we. When asked, who are you, it would respond, we are. Though they refused to write, they could understand English, and the doctor who gave the mathematics test later killed himself after writing out one of the equations the creature had given for an answer. This equation and its answer were responsible for several deaths in the following 40 years. After the tests, the grey went to a torpor, and the researchers were afraid they had died. It became cold to the touch and didn't move in the room it was kept in for the next 33 years. A study of their hieroglyphic language that had been on the debris from the craft found that it was similar to Mayan or ancient Egyptian and as such acted as a kind of Rosetta Stone and allowed the humans to partially discern it. 
It was eventually determined by SSG-1 in 1949 that the Eves had a psychic hive mind, with the likes of writing and data storage being nothing more than nostalgia. They believed that information transfer was instant and complete, though any command structure was indeterminable. SSG-1 also believed that they came from a small world in the M31 star cluster and that it was destroyed by some world-changing event, most probably consumed by their star. They thought that space travel had existed as far back as they could recall and that they had abandoned technology due to the detrimental effect it had upon their world. They came up with the theory that only a few thousand of them were left and that they were off-world when the apocalyptic events happened and that this particular cast of species were bred for space travel and discovery. They believed that these events happened around 3 million years ago and that the Greys had moved planet to planet, collecting samples in order to rejuvenate their species. When they discovered Earth, around 2500 BC, they found out that humans were 95% genetically compatible. As such, they settled their ship in orbit around Pluto and started studying humanity. They had no issues hiding themselves from humanity, however with the crash in 1947 and the quick evolution of humans' technology, their hand was forced and relations were formally opened. The SSG were partially correct in many instances, but for entirely the wrong reasons. Okay, that concludes part one of this series. If you found this video useful, don't forget to like and share it, and make sure to subscribe for more Bud Explained videos in the future. Bud out.